Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah Sellers is off today. We begin this morning with President Biden in Europe for a high stakes emergency summit as the war in Ukraine enters a second month. Right now, the president is meeting with NATO leaders in Brussels. NBC News has just learned the president is expected to announce plans for the U.S. to welcome more than 100,000 refugees from Ukraine. He's also set to announce more troop increases and additional support for Ukraine, plus extra sanctions against Russia, which the U.S. now confirms is committing war crimes. Russia's forces have destroyed apartment buildings, schools, hospitals, other elements of the critical civilian infrastructure. And we believe that the, exa the exact civilian death toll will be in the thousands. All this is Ukraine fights to take back territory. UK officials say counterattacks are working in the outskirts of Kyiv. But in key cities like Mariupol, thousands of civilians are still trying to get out. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky speaking to NATO leaders this morning, calling for the world's support. And last night, he addressed his country and the world, marking one month since the invasion began. The war of Russia is not only the war against Ukraine. Its meaning is much wider. Russia started the war against freedom as it is. We have team coverage for you this morning. Colonel Matt Dimmick is the former director for Russia and Eastern Europe at the National Security Council. But let's start with NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman at the NATO summit in Brussels. Josh, good morning to you. I want to start with that video address from President Zelensky. What is his message to NATO this morning? Well, Joe, we heard from President Zelensky in an address that he gave in a closed session, but the remarks were posted to Facebook, and we are translating them now. Uh, the key message from President Zelensky, he wants the West and Europe to understand just how dire the stakes are, saying in that speech to NATO uh, that these allies must understand that they are now in a gray area between the rest the West and Russia. Zelenska saying they've been defending themselves for a month with heroic resistance, uh, but that it has been a month of dark suffering and impunity for the destruction of a peaceful country. And Zelensky also making the interesting comment that he says, never again tell us that our army does not meet NATO standards. So you hear him uh, there uh, using the fact that Ukraine has put up an unexpectedly strong resistance uh, as yet one more argument for why his country should be entitled to NATO membership, uh, even though NATO has made clear that's not something that's going to happen in the near term. And in fact, uh, we know that one of the issues that Ukraine has been discussing uh, in peace talks with the Russians is potentially uh, stepping back from their aspirations to join NATO uh, in hopes of getting some type of an end to this war. So, Josh, this is a critical meeting for President Biden and America's NATO allies. And we are expecting a big yeah. announcement from the U.S. today about refugees. What more can you tell us about that? And really, President Biden's goal goals overall for this summit. Well, on the refugees, NBC News now reporting that the Biden administration uh, plans to accept about 100,000 Ukrainian refugees, and that will be through a mix of different programs, including uh, immigrant visas, non-immigrant visas, uh, and other uh, avenues that the administration has to be able to bring uh, those refugees into the country and give them safe haven. We are also expecting new sanctions to be announced today by the U.S. Uh, and its allies to try to ramp up the economic pressure uh, on Russia as they are opening their stock market partially today for the first time since the war started uh, as their economy is really in tatters. And we also expect new announcements from NATO and the United States in terms of bolstering the defense of the NATO alliance, uh, with NATO expected to agree on creating four new multinational battle groups. These are combat-ready uh, units that will be uh, involving multiple countries that will be deployed to Eastern European countries like Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria and will stay indefinitely as NATO tries to make clear that it intends to defend every inch of its territory if President Putin were to extend his aggression beyond Ukraine. And Josh, the president's arrival comes on the heels of this assessment from the State Department saying that Secretary of State Antony Blinken said yesterday, quote, we've seen numerous credible reports of indiscriminate attacks and attacks deliberately targeting civilians as well as other atrocities. Today, I can announce that based on information currently available, the U.S government assesses that members of Russia's forces have committed war crimes in Ukraine. 
is a pretty powerful statement. We've been waiting perhaps a few days, if not weeks, to hear something like that. How does this change the nature of the West's approach to Russia now during this conflict? Well, this moves into the official category, something that uh, officials have said personally for some time, including President Biden, uh, Secretary Blinken, as well as Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who all said they felt that President Putin had committed uh, war crimes. Now the government is saying it uh, officially, and it's an important symbolic move that tries to really uh, take the momentum uh, right now of all of these Western nations condemning Russia and move it to the next level. But the reality is it is very difficult to see a path for President Putin uh, to face accountability uh, for war crimes when it comes to the International Criminal Court. Russia is not a member, neither, by the way, is the U.S. or Ukraine. Uh, and while there is a way that the United Nations Security Council can refer a country that's not a member to the ICC uh, for the crime of aggression, Russia has a veto at the U.N. Security Council. So that's unlikely to happen as well. So while a symbolic move that is very important, there is still a long path ahead uh, for the world to get justice for President Putin when it comes to any kind of a criminal proceeding. Josh Letterman at the NATO summit in Brussels. Josh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Let's bring in retired Colonel Matt Divick now for more on today's summit. So, Colonel, good morning. It has been one month now since Russia invaded Ukraine. We have seen a host of sanctions taken by the U.S. and really the West against Russia in response. First, do you think this summit is going to lead to even more sanctions that could have an impact? And is it possible we could see Russia removed from the G20 altogether? I think all the, all those are on the table, and it uh, certainly uh, is the time is right for more sanctions. Obviously, uh, the extraordinary sanctions that are already in place are long term. They're not having an immediate impact on Russia's activities in Ukraine or even stopping their invasion. So there's going to be a, an urge to pile on even more sanctions. What's left on the table? Uh, you know, there's a few extra sectoral sanctions. You could remove more banks from SWIFT. You could do those types of things. Uh, at, at this point, some of those are marginal. So I'm not sure what uh, extra juice is left to squeeze out of the sanctions, uh, but we'll, we'll see. I think there's an appetite for, for doing more, or at least to be seen as doing more. Uh, and you know, certainly removing Russia from the G20 would be welcome. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that uh, some, some members of the G20 would go along with it. Hovering over all this, Colonel, is the nuclear threat. In a recent interview, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov refused to rule out the use of nuclear weapons if it faced what he called an existential threat. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg had this response to those comments. Russia must stop its nuclear saber rattling. This is dangerous and it is irresponsible. NATO is there to protect and defend all allies, and we convey a very clear message to Russia that the nuclear war can not be won and should never be fought. So, Colonel, what's your take on this back and forth when it comes to this nuclear rhetoric, and where do you see all this going from here? So Russia employs a nuclear rhetoric, of course, to uh, you know, scare other countries, uh, try to uh, put basically a veto on uh, U.S. actions, NATO actions as a, as a scare tactic. I, I think we see it for what it is, and we recognize that they're using this as part of their escalatory dialogue and back and forth, trying to keep uh, U.S. and NATO actions off the table. It's not not working. Uh, you know, U.S. and NATO are certainly calling uh, Russia's bluff on uh, some of the initial rhetoric, but uh, uh, Stoltenberg's very correct to to, to uh, call Russia on this type of really reckless rhetoric when it comes to talking about uh, you know upping the, the nuclear forces and their readiness that uh, President Putin had addressed before. These are all dangerous uh, types of discussions. You know, most of our uh, near misses in in history uh, have involved uh, miscommunications, miscalculations, and you know, sloppy uh, sloppy back and forth when it comes to our our nuclear forces. So any. Anything that can tamp down the rhetoric and take off the, the use of nuclear weapons off the table would be would be welcome. And Russia would be uh, would be wise to uh, you know maybe tamp down some of what they're saying. And Colonel, quickly, I want to ask you about President Zelensky's address to NATO leaders today. Do you think it's going to have an impact and get NATO to step up its efforts to help Ukraine? Well, every time Zelensky appears before a, a body or a group, uh, he manages to uh, move emotions and, and get action and a lot of action oriented towards support of Ukraine. So I think he'll have the same effect along uh, with these NATO leaders, many of which he's spoken to personally. So I think I think NATO will definitely 
uh, listen to what Zelensky has to say and do everything they can to provide as much support uh, all the way to the maximum that they're willing to give. Colonel Matt Dimmick, as always, thank you so much for your analysis. We appreciate it. Now, the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine is taking center stage again this morning. The country's deputy prime minister says seven evacuation routes have been agreed on for today. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter is in Lviv for us again this morning. So, Molly, you know, we also heard from President Zelensky last night. That was a global rallying call that was marking one month since the war began. Tell us, what was that message, his message there to the world? Joe, good morning. And you see me looking down at my phone because we're actually just getting lines out of Zelensky's newest speech right now. And I just want to share with you uh, what we are learning right now. He says, and this is breaking news right now, he says that Russia has shelled and has used phosphorus bombs. Quote, this morning we had phosphorus bombs from Russia. People were killed. Children were killed. President Zelensky has just said that, Joe. Now, we are waiting for more of his information. I'm sorry, I'm just looking down. We're just getting these translations right now. I do, however, want to share, as you originally asked, what he said. He had a rallying cry for the world. He asked everyone to come out right now, today, on the 24th, and protest. Take a quick listen to that soundbite. I ask you to stand against the war, starting from March 24th, exactly one month after the Russian invasion. From this day, and after them, show your standing, come from your offices, your homes, your schools and universities, come in the name of peace. Now, we are also hearing, and I'm just getting these translations right now, Joe, he is saying that we are in a gray area between the West and Russia, but we're bright people. We have defend, been defending ourselves for a month. He calls it a month of heroic resistance. He says a month of the darkest suffering. We expect him to appeal to NATO leaders today, both as leaders, of course, asked to close the sky. He will absolutely say that he will ask for air defenses. He will talk about what his people need, and you can definitely expect him to talk specifically about the suffering that we are seeing uh, in places like Mariupol, Joe. Ollie. Thank you for giving us those updates as we continue to hear what President Zelensky is saying. I also want to ask you, Molly, Ukraine's military says it's destroyed a large Russian landing ship at a port city that is southwest of Mariupol. What can you tell us about that? How significant is this attack? Yeah, and we don't know that much beyond Ukrainian military claims. They say they have shelled a Russian landing ship off the coast of Berdyansk. Berdyansk, as you say, is just up the coast from Mariupol, but it is on that strategic uh, belt, the, that coastal belt that the Russians have been trying to take between Mariupol and Odessa on one end of the Black Sea. Berdyansk is also interesting because it is on the evacuation route for anyone leaving Mariupol, Joe. So in order to get out of Mariupol to the safety of Zaporizhia, what's happening is the people are driving private cars out of Mariupol to a couple of villages. Buses are then taking them down to Berdyansk on the coast and then up to Zaporizhia. So if Berdyansk, start, Berdyansk starts to get dangerous, that completely throws off uh, any kind of relative safe route for people in Mariupol to get out. And by the latest reporting, uh, according to President Zelensky, 100,000 people are still trapped inside that city, Jeff. A huge number of people. Molly, while I have you, I also want to ask you about the situation in and around Kyiv. Ukrainians are having some success pushing back Russian forces, even recapturing some territory, aren't they? That's exactly right. It's not just a story of Russian failure, but it is now also a story of the Ukrainians really pushing hard around the capital and pushing Russian forces back. So according to a senior U.S. defense official, Ukrainian troops have now pushed Russian troops 15 miles more east of Kyiv. The same senior U.S. defense official tells our team in Washington that Russian troops are digging in, digging into defensive positions, which allows the Ukrainian troops to really go on the offense, Joe. It also says they are stalled in the north around Chernihiv. They are stalled in the south around Mykolaiv. Mykolaiv is between Mariupol uh, and Odessa. It's very close to Kherson, and the Russians are having a very hard time getting around Mykolaiv, where they want to kind of move even closer west to Odessa. It also, interestingly, we've been talking about this number a lot from the Ukrainian side, Joe, but part of uh, the Russian struggle and the Rus Russian frustration is they have lost a lot of troops. Now, according to a NATO estimate, they've lost between seven and 15,000 troops. That's a lot of manpower. Now, according to a UK defense official, Joe, this morning, they say that as Russians are looking to fill those troops, they may start with foreign mercenaries, foreign fighters, or start recruiting more people in Russia 
to send into the battlefield given those losses, Joe. All right, Molly Hunter reporting from Lviv. Molly, thank you so much. I want to get more on all this uh, in Ukraine with Colonel Mark Hansian. He's a senior advisor with the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, first of all, I just want to ask you about what Molly was reporting about, President Zelensky saying phosphorus bombs are being used, people being killed, children being killed. What were your thoughts when you heard Molly reporting that just now? Well, all militaries use white phosphorus. Uh, it's a substance that will burn very intensely and uh, it's used for marking and for smoke screens. But against personnel uh, and civilians, uh, it gets on skin and it causes uh, uh, terrible burns. It's not supposed to be used against personnel. So now as we hit this one month mark since the start of the war, just what is your assessment of how the conflict has played out so far? I mean, a month ago, did you think this was really going to unfold in a totally different way? What are your thoughts now one month in? Well, I think it surprised everyone. Uh, there have been now three phases of the war. The first phase was the blitzkrieg that uh, the Russians attempted to get into Kiev very quickly, knock off the, the government and achieve a quick victory. That, of course, failed. They then moved into a second phase where they reinforced their uh, four axes of advance from the north, northeast, east, and south. Uh, they achieved some success in the south. Uh, they ground forward in the other areas, but have now uh, uh, come to a, a stall. Um, and now they seem to be digging in. Uh, it looks to be a war of attrition. They're using their firepower. Uh, the Ukrainians are beginning to uh, counterattack, and it looks to, that uh, both sides are uh, digging in for a, a long war of attrition. I mean, you said in a recent interview, you don't think Russia can go on beyond another three weeks if its troops continue to suffer casualties at the high rate that's being reported. We've heard they're struggling with food, with gas, with the cold weather. Going forward, do you think we could see a change in Russian tactics to try and mitigate their losses? And if so, what might that look like? Well, the Russians have taken a lot of casualties, as, as you heard. And uh, if, uh, say, they've taken 10,000 killed, they're generally twice as many uh, wounded. Their entire force going in, the ground force, was only about 150,000. So they may have lost 25% of their uh, initial force. That's a very high, uh, very high number. They're reinforcing from out elsewhere. They're trying to bring in uh, perhaps some mercenaries, but those won't be enough to fill the ranks. You have to keep in mind that the Russian uh, armed forces today, the army is only about 280,000. This is not the Red Army of World War II that marched to victory over the bodies of its dead. It's much smaller, and it's very sensitive to casualties. So these casualties are very significant. The Russians are also using a lot of their stockpiles of um, munitions and uh, uh, other uh, supplies. They're not getting reinforced, unlike the Ukrainians. And for that reason, I think that time is on the uh, side of the Ukrainians, although there are other people uh, who think that the Russians may still be able to grind the uh, Ukrainians down. And um, there's also some possibility in, in the east that the uh, Russians might get the uh, get the upper hand. But right now, things are looking much, much better for uh, the Ukrainians. And Colonel, we've been talking about the NATO summit underway in Brussels. Real quickly, how careful do you think the alliance needs to be right now to avoid direct confrontation with Russia? Well, NATO and, and the president have been emphatic that they want to avoid uh, direct confrontation. Um, you know, that has the possibility for uh, escalation. And what they're doing now seems to be pretty successful. That is flooding the Ukrainians with uh, weapons and, and supplies. So I think you'll see a continuing uh, pushback against things like uh, humanitarian zones and uh, no-fly zones uh, and uh, maybe a doubling down on uh, supplying uh, weapons and munitions. Colonel Mark Hansian, a lot to talk about this morning. We appreciate your analysis. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, man. Breaking overnight, new concerns over North Korea's weapons program after that country launched an intercontinental ballistic missile toward Japanese waters. This is the first long-range missile launched by North Korea since 2017, violating several U.N.-issued sanctions. Officials say the launch suggests that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un may be creating a missile system capable of striking the U.S. Now, in response today, South Korea fired multiple ballistic and tactical missiles. Press Secretary Jen Psaki released a statement earlier this morning saying, quote, the United States strongly condemns the Democratic People's Republic of Korea for its test of a long-range ballistic missile. Pyongyang must immediately cease its destabilizing actions. The United States will take all necessary measures to ensure the security of the American homeland and Republic of Korea and Japanese allies.
The country is remembering America's history-making Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. She died yesterday at the age of 84. This morning, flags at the White House are being flown at half-staff. In a statement, President Biden said Albright defied convention and broke barriers again and again. Back in 1993, then-President Bill Clinton named Albright the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations shortly after he was inaugurated. Then in 1996, history was made when he nominated Albright to be the first woman to serve the Secretary of State. This is a dream come true, actually a dream I never thought I could have, and I feel great. Joining us now is former special advisor to President Clinton, Guy Smith. Thank you so much for joining us to reflect on the life and legacy of the Secretary. You know, I know you traveled to Sarajevo with President Clinton and Madeleine Albright when they visited that war-torn region back in 1997. You also played a role in Secretary Albright's visit to North Korean leader Kim Jong-il. So what will you remember most about this groundbreaking Secretary of State? Well, she was uh, truly a, a national treasure, as President Clinton called her yesterday. She, um, she spoke her mind diplomatically, but very sharply, and she was able to use uh, sometimes very sharp words and sharp actions, like with the Iraqis and Saddam Hussein, to make very strong points for the United States. And uh, she she brought to uh, the the very serious nature of uh, diplomacy for the United States in a very unique way. I remember on that flight, we were coming home. Uh, uh, on Air Force One uh, from Sarajevo. It was the middle of the night, somewhere over the Atlantic. Everyone was tired. I walked into the uh, the big conference room in the front of the plane, and there, lying on the floor, sound asleep on the plush carpet, was Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, and uh, she she could uh, she could take a good break and uh, and have a lot of fun and be very very serious and get a lot done. She's just was a true inspiration to everybody and certainly to young women in this country. That's a skill to be able to nap in a place like that. You know, we're not we're not just reflecting on her legacy, we're reflecting on her life. And Albright was born in Czechoslovakia, came to the U.S. When her, with her family as they were fleeing communism. Talk about how her background, her childhood, really shaped her foreign policy views. Well, she, she felt blessed to hold that position as as that clip that you ran showed uh, what she said. And uh, she was always thinking about the, the gift of the United States and what it means to both citizens of long term that were born here and citizens that have come here. That is in very sharp relief today with so much uh, debate and then certainly this week. Uh, with the uh, the Ukrainian situation and the, the new announcement this morning that there'll be some Ukrainians that can come to the United States, that would be something that she would have very much endorsed and embraced and advocated for. And, um, and I think she would be highly complimentary of the European countries that are around Ukraine who, um, who have welcomed in Ukrainian refugees, um, not every single one of them, but most of them, uh, led by Poland. Uh, there are so many of the Ukrainian refugees, and what uh, what will make them strong is what made her strong is their their love of, of freedom, and this is something that she brought to her job at the UN, at the at the United Nations, and even back when she was a professor uh, at Georgetown. Guy Smith, thank you so much for helping us reflect on Secretary Albright this morning. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Coming up on Morning News Now, history and heated questions on Capitol Hill. No, Senator, I didn't say versus. That's exactly what you said. Senator, every person in all of these uh, charts and documents, I sent to jail. When we return, highlights from the final day of questioning for Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. Plus, picking up the pieces, how communities across the South are working together to recover from a series of severe storms. Welcome back. More of our coverage on the war in Ukraine coming up, including a report on the ground with Ukrainian refugees in Poland and the anti-war Russians trying to get to the U.S. via Mexico. First, here are some of the other stories making news right now. 
And Capitol Hill Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson is one step closer to a confirmation vote. Lawmakers will enter the final day of hearings this morning. For two days and more than 23 hours of questioning, Judge Jackson was repeatedly pressed on her record in a range of politically charged issues, especially crime. Here's some of what she had to say. I understand the need for law enforcement, the importance of uh, having people who are willing to do that important work, the importance of holding people accountable for their criminal behavior. We also have a society that ensures that people who have been accused of criminal behavior are treated fairly. That is what our Constitution requires. That is what makes our system so exceptional. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale has been following the confirmation hearings for us all this week. Joins us now with more. Ali, good morning. So what were some of the big moments from this final round of questioning? Final round of questioning, Joe, it's going to clock out that Judge Jackson will have taken almost le just less than 24 hours worth of questions over this week. So the testimonies portion of this now wrapping up, that's not to say there weren't some fireworks moments. I know that the goal at the beginning of the week for the White House was to elevate this out of the partisan. That's not exactly how it went. And there's really no better moment that exemplifies this than Senator Lindsey Graham yesterday. Listen to that. Senator, she's had nothing to do with the cause. No, but Kavanaugh I'm hearing. asking her you about won't, you won't even how, her how she response. may feel about what y'all did. Uh, Just to answer the question. It, it, it. Senator, I don't have any comment on what procedures took place in this body regarding What would you think Justice about the Kavanaugh here? Kavanaugh, what I'd like finish? to answer... Joe, there they were talking about the hearings of Justice Kavanaugh. We know that's something that Senator Lindsey Graham has brought up repeatedly. But you're right. A lot of these other exchanges hinged on crime. They hinged on child pornography sentencing. All of the key issues that Republicans have been seizing on repeatedly throughout the course of these hearings. Senator Lindsey Graham, Senator Ted Cruz getting some of those most contentious moments. And I got to tell you, around that Lindsey Graham moment, Senator Patrick Leahy, who is the longest serving senator, he has done 20 of these confirmation hearings for Supreme Court justices. He he came out to my camera yesterday right after that Lindsey Graham moment. He said those questions were beyond the pale, that Graham was badgering Judge Jackson, and that he was distressed for the state of the Senate, given the way that that went down. Yeah, we also saw him speak out after Senator Cruz was asking some questions yesterday, too. Yeah. So let's talk about more about the Democrats' response. What did you hear from them yesterday, and how optimistic are they about getting Judge Jackson confirmed? Look, Joe, they have felt good this entire time, mostly because in this instance, the 50-50 split works in their favor. They just need all 50 Democrats to come together behind the judge. Vice President Kamala Harris will come in and break the tie when it makes it to the full Senate floor. That's not to say that there's not a little bit of politicking going on in the meantime. There's questions right now over a documents request that could slow down this process. Doesn't seem like it's going to at this point. Of course, we'll come back to you if that ends up being the case. But yesterday really was a moment for Democrats of showcasing the nominee, and no one did it better than Senator Cory Booker. And I want to tell you when I look at you, this is why I get emotional. I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're a person that is so much more than your race and gender. You're a Christian, you're a mom, you're, you're, you're an intellect, you love books. But for me, I'm sorry, I, I, it's hard for me not to look at you and not see my mom, not to see my, my cousins, one of them who had to come here and sit behind you. She had to be, she had to have your back. I see my ancestors and yours. Nobody's going to steal the joy of that woman in the street or the calls that I'm getting or the texts. Nobody's going to steal that joy. You have earned this spot. You are worthy. You are a great American. Joe, that was one of the most emotional moments the second day in a row that Cory Booker has made the judge tear up. And that's the picture that is going around social media right now. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson with a single tear coming down her cheek as she listened to Cory Booker give those remarks in her honor yesterday in the chamber. A lot of people were dabbing their eyes with tissues. It really was one of those seminal moments when we talk about the larger conversation around representation mattering. That's exactly why. And Alice, very quickly, what's next? 
We got more testimony, but not for Judge Jackson. We have some American Bar Association lawyers, as well as advocates from the Democratic side, advocates from the Republican side. Each of the sides, Republican and Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, got to choose the witnesses that would come forward today. So we will hear from both of those. And then, of course, this will move to the next procedural phase, not next week, but likely the week after that, when they actually begin marking this up and trying to send this nomination out of the Judiciary Committee to the full Senate floor. With an Easter deadline on their calendars. All right, Ali Vitale, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. Let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather Bill Cairns is with us. Hey, Bill, good morning. Hey, good morning. Great to see you. Uh, soggy morning for the East Coast, but at least we're not dealing with anything like, you know, tornadoes and all that mess that we had the last couple of days. In the New Orleans tornado, by the way, yesterday morning, you know, because of the damage, I was speculating it could have been as strong as an EF3 tornado. And the National Weather Service did confirm that. The uh, drone video and the aerial video going and flying over all these properties, you know, just really shows you, uh, you know, if you want to survive one of these storms, you know, especially a tornado this strong, interior rooms. I mean, just look at that house right there. All the outer rooms had collapsed. Uh, go to your interior if you don't have a basement. That's why you try to put as many walls between yourself and the tornado as possible. Um, into the, usually interior bathroom is recommended in a bathtub if possible. Uh, some homes were completely demolished, some ones that weren't built as well. Other ones had significant roof damage. Uh, vehicles were flipped, and you could see uh, damage like that is typical of an EF3 tornado, winds up to 160 miles per hour. So what do we have for today? So the storm system that did produce all those tornadoes is still lingering right along the East Coast. We have significant amounts of rain in North Florida and right along the coast of Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina. And as we slide up the coast, we're still seeing some areas of heavy rain in areas around Norfolk, Virginia Beach. And then in northern New England, higher elevations actually had some snow and sleet and freezing rain to deal with, but just rain for all of the highly populated cities and for all the major highways. So this is how it will play out today by one o'clock rain still lingering along the coastal areas. It looks like it's going to hang around too till at least 6 p.m., maybe even after that. It won't be till morning that we finally get rid of that storm system. And in behind it will be kind of cold and chilly weather too, especially for northern New England. So the forecast for today, kind of chilly, raw, damp, northeast, also the Midwest, storms in the southeast, but not severe weather. And then the weekend forecast shapes up kind of quiet. The only thing we'll be watching is some cold, chilly air coming from the Midwest, Great Lakes on Saturday, and then Sunday into the Northeast. About, I'd say about 80% of the country, though, Joe, is going to have a fantastic weekend. All right. That's good to hear. We've kept you busy this week, so hopefully it is quiet. Bill, thank you so yeah. much. Now, in the aftermath of those southern storms, communities are banding together to help those who lost everything. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky shows us how. Life interrupted by Mother Nature at its worst. A family dinner, bedtime, a lifetime of memories turned upside down for communities in Texas to Mississippi and now Louisiana. Yet somehow the damage pales in comparison to the determination to keep moving forward. Volunteers cleaning up neighborhoods just hours after being torn apart by tornadoes. Others making sure those who lost everything have something. We just cannot explain how thankful we are for everybody's help. In Gilmer, Texas, the baseball team wearing gloves of a different kind. While in hard hit Araby, Louisiana. The only instinct I knew was to bring my generator in my flatbed truck and see what I can do. Volunteer Nate Barron helping strangers. What do you tell the folks now picking up the pieces? I can tell you, you just hug them, you let them tell you what you need to do. You just feel it. Despite the damage to Stacy Mancuso Labee's home, she's ready for what's next. You know what? Life's a puzzle and you just constantly have to put those pieces back together. They press on, finding hope in each other. And it will no doubt take some time to move on from this. Officials here in St. Bernard Parish tell me that they have uh, already requested federal help in allowing them to clear the debris from these hard hit areas as fast as possible, uh, knowing that hurricane season isn't too far away. Morgan Chesky, thank you so much for that report. Coming up, 3.6 million refugees and counting. When we return here on Morning News Now, a closer look at the humanitarian crisis unfolding across Europe one month into the war in Ukraine. Plus, it's not just Ukrainians trying to escape. White Russians are now turning up at the U.S. border with Mexico.
UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is calling on allies to step up efforts to support Ukraine. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudia Lavanga joins us now with more on that story and other ways the international community is reacting to the war in Ukraine. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Well, Boris Johnson has confirmed that the UK will send an additional 6,000 missiles to Ukraine, well, making the total to 10,000 missiles so far. Now, it also said that the UK will fund with 25 million pounds, about 30 million dollars, the police and military uh, forces there. And in a statement that Johnson issued ahead of today's NATO meeting, he praised the Ukrainian resistance and he said that the UK, alongside uh, its allies, will strengthen their defense and turn the tide, he said, of this war. And elsewhere, the ripple effect of the war in Ukraine is being felt around the world, including Turkey, where the rise in energy and food prices have dampened hopes of an economic recovery after the pandemic. The tourism industry there is also bracing for the loss of revenue from the predictable drop of Russian and Ukrainian visitors that usually holiday in the country. And around 100 Ukrainian circus students who fled the war have found a new home, or rather, a new circus in Hungary. The young Ukrainians will now be able to swing on the trapeze or jungle rings or twirl on aerial silks in a school for acrobats in Budapest. And on top of it, uh, this week, the, all the proceeds of a special two nights at the Circus of Budapest, the capital of Hungary, will go to buy new circus equipment for this young Ukrainian's job. Those shows will be sold out. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate it. In Ukraine's neighboring countries, resources are starting to dry up, with refugees still fleeing their country one month after the invasion began. Eastern European countries have opened their borders, and the international community is rallying to support refugees who left everything behind. But now leaders are feeling the pressure to make sure that support remains as the war intensifies. NBC News senior national correspondent Jay Gray is in Warsaw, Poland, with more. Jay, good morning. We spoke to you yesterday, 24 hours ago. You were literally on the road to Warsaw. Now that you've arrived, what are conditions like there in the capital? Well, Joe, I want to show you firsthand, and we're in the main train station here in Warsaw, a major crossroads for hundreds of thousands fleeing violence in Ukraine. And you can see there are pockets of refugees scattered across the three levels of this train station, getting some rest where they can, sitting, charging phones uh, because they don't have that opportunity all that often. Look, we've talked about it. Poland is for long-term stays as far as these uh, refugees are concerned. Not a, a, a very viable option anymore. And you can see some across the way here uh, resting, sleeping uh, along the back wall here, trying to get a couple of hours here. But because it's filling up so quickly, in Warsaw in particular, taking more refugees than any other city, you see downstairs a line at the ticket counter. A lot of the folks who have uh, made the escape now trying to figure out how and where they are going to go next. 300,000 refugees in Warsaw alone right now. The mayor says that's upped his population by 20 percent in just three weeks. They're providing health care. They're providing schooling and other city services for those who are here and staying long term. And he really says that stretch this area to its limits, that that he needs some help. He says he stays up in the middle of the night calling other mayors in Poland and other cities across uh, Europe just trying to find someone who can uh, help. And you know the president's going to be here tomorrow, so surely that's going to be something they talk about as well. Yeah, so, Jay, we know the European Union is set to discuss so-called fair burden sharing for hosting millions of Ukrainian refugees. This yes. morning, NBC is reporting the U.S. is expected to welcome up to 100,000 refugees. It's according to a source familiar with the Biden administration thinking. Is there hope these developments could help ease the situation there in Poland? Oh, absolutely. I think the people here will take anything they can get because they are stretched so thin. And, and they, they vowed to not let any of these refugees slip between the cracks. But finding a spot for them is the issue. So 100,000 going to the U.S., that really ups the number. What we know about that plan, Joe, is that it really targets those who have families in the U.S. and cuts away some of that red tape of, of getting them into country. But it also is for those who are most vulnerable in the war zone, trying to pull them out and get them to safety. Jay Gray reporting from Warsaw. Jay, thank you so much. It's not just Ukrainians. Russians are starting to arrive at the U.S. border with Mexico, hoping to seek asylum from political persecution back home. 
They face a major hurdle. The border is officially closed to asylum seekers because of COVID policies. While many Ukrainians are granted exceptions, Russians are less likely to get the same waivers. NBC News correspondent Juan Venegas explains. We know that Ukrainians have been arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border seeking asylum in the U.S., but right there next to them are groups of Russians. Yet, with the Ukrainians getting an opportunity to seek asylum, these Russians are getting stuck at the border. A Russian camp with families, including children, set right at the U.S. border. They oppose the invasion of Ukraine and have fled across the world with no visas to enter the U.S. <laughs> Camping out for days in front of the port of entry, Anton and his wife Julia say going back home is not an option. Yes, I do feel unsafe in Russia uh, because uh, there has been some police tracking uh, after me. I know that uh, my political activism is known, uh, is, uh, has been noticed by the government. The Mexican government is now bracing for more Russians on the way, but their arrivals began before the war, with 75,000 flying in last year and another 28,000 since the beginning of this year, many of them now attempting to seek asylum in the U.S. This group rushing the San Diego port of entry in September of last year. Others renting or buying cars to make it just a few feet inside American territory where the car is then left behind. Illegal actions triggered by necessity. With the border still officially close to asylum seekers, the current policy known as Title 42 that was put in place during the pandemic has been shutting the door to people from all countries with strong pushback from human rights groups. What should the U.S. government do? We're asking that Title 42 end today and that the United States resume the asylum process for vulnerable people from all over the world that come to our U.S. southern border. The Department of Homeland Security has issued guidance to border agents, reminding them exemptions can be given for humanitarian reasons. An internal memo of that guidance, reported by CVS News, shows Ukrainians mentioned, but not the Russians. At the border, most Ukrainians being allowed to enter, while Anton and Julia watch along with other Russians. We already here about a week, so well, I would like to well, just wash my hair and so on. <laughs> so we decided to go. My husband is a bit sick, so you hear his voice. Julia and her group had to pick up the camp and move away from the port of entry, but they'll remain at the border with other Russians stuck in limbo. Now, there's no indication that specific immigration policy will be put in place to help the Russians. What we know is that the changes being made by the Biden administration have helped the Ukrainians. There's the temporary protection status given to those that were already inside the United States when the war started. Then there's also the guidance that was issued to the border officials uh, telling them they can't give these humanitarian exemptions to the Ukrainians. And now the Biden administration is getting ready to reveal a new plan that would bring refugees, these are special vulnerable refugees in Ukraine, it would allow them to come directly into the U.S. Guad Venegas, thank you so much. Coming up, royal backlash. Prince William and Kate's tour of the Caribbean being met with protests, how their royal trip is exposing major tensions with Commonwealth countries. And a millennial mainstay now getting a Gen Z revival. We'll show you how the new TikTok trend that's giving reading rainbow new life. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, good morning. Well, the CEOs of American United, Delta, Southwest, and JetBlue are urging President Biden to end the federal mask mandate on flights and testing requirements for international travel. They sent a letter to the White House yesterday. They say the restrictions are no longer aligned with the realities of the current health environment. The Biden administration has extended the mask mandate for airlines, airports and public transit through April 18. Arizona is the first state to officially roll out Apple's digital driver's license and state ID. Residents can add them to the Apple wallet and tap their iPhone or Apple Watch to present them at select TSA checkpoints at the Phoenix airport. 
Initially, though, only travelers with TSA PreCheck will be able to use the digital ID feature, and passengers must still have their physical ID available if needed. Apple says additional states will offer the ID feature soon, including Connecticut, Kentucky, Iowa, Ohio, and Oklahoma, as well as Puerto Rico. Instacart wants to help grocery stores get in on the super fast delivery game. It's announcing several new services for its retail partners, including many fulfillment warehouses. They're designed to help supermarkets build the infrastructure to support 15 minute delivery. The new service will start with some public stores in Atlanta and Miami in the coming months. Back to you. All right, always good to have more options. Silvana, thank Absolutely. you so much. You got it. Prince William and Kate are facing a lot of backlash during their tour of the Caribbean on behalf of the Queen. Their trip was meant to strengthen ties with Commonwealth nations, but instead it's exposing tensions. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is at Kensington Palace with the latest. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. This royal tour was intended to be a celebration in honor of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, but at times it has been marred by controversy because of Britain's ties to slavery. In Jamaica, Prince William addresses head on in a keynote speech. Overnight, a landmark speech in Jamaica. I want to express my profound sorrow. Slavery was abhorrent and it should never have happened. Prince William, the future head of the royal family, answering for past wrongs but stopping short of a full apology. Those remarks happening just hours after Jamaica's prime minister announced the island nation's plans to break away from the British monarchy and remove the queen as its head of state. Jamaica is, as you would see, uh, a country that is very proud of our history, very proud of what we have achieved, and uh, we are moving on. Those comments coming after dozens of protesters gathered in Kingston, demanding an apology and reparations for Britain's slave trading past. Jamaica was once a British colony, and hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans were forced to work on its plantations. That the appalling atrocity of slavery forever stains our history. While the pain runs deep, Jamaica continues to forge its future with determination courage and fortitude. William and Kate's Caribbean charm offensive appears to be hitting a snag at nearly every stop. A protest in Belize, canceling their first engagement. Then in Jamaica, this photo showing the couple greeting children through a wire fence, criticized by some. But despite the controversies, the royals are also receiving many warm welcomes as they celebrate Jamaican culture. From playing the drums at Bob Marley's home to a soccer scrimmage and this selfie with the Jamaican bobsledding team. The royal couple forging ahead, trying to make the most of their eight-day Caribbean tour. And Buckingham Palace has not yet responded to our requests for comment when it comes to Jamaica's future, but historically in the past, their position has been to allow the people to become a republic if they so choose. As far as the royal tour, William and Kate are headed off to the Bahamas next. Joe, back to you. Kathy Park, thank you so much. You may not recognize her name or face, but generations of children have loved Tina Fabrique's voice. Take a listen. in the sky I can go twice as high Yes, you'll have that song in your head all day long. Reading Rainbow was a mainstay on children's television for more than two decades and the theme song is getting new life on TikTok, of course. Joining us now to explain why is NBC News youth and internet culture reporter Callan Rosenblatt. Callan, good to have you with us. So first, give us sort of the basic foundation here. What is this latest trend on TikTok? Yeah, Joe. So this trend is, it's very silly, very lighthearted. There is a uh, filter that's called space and it will basically take your face and have it scrolling past the sun, math equations, uh, you know, <laughs> planets. And people are using this to basically uh, express some kind of uh, 
confusion or question. There was one that said, um, is the S or the C in scent silent? Uh, there was one of a golden retriever that said, how come uh, I get two meals a day, but mom and dad get eight meals a day? So uh, it's very silly, very lighthearted. But under all of these is Tina Fembrick's voice singing the Reading Rainbow theme. But very few people have acknowledged who Tina is. They just know her voice, like you said. And you recently spoke with Tina. I mean, what is her take on all of this? She is absolutely loving this. She actually didn't even know what was going on on TikTok. She doesn't have a TikTok. So it actually took her grandson letting her know uh, that this was underway. And this is what she had to say about learning uh, about this trend from her grandson. My grandson, Brian Newkirk, he called me. It, this is so funny, time-wise. It's like about a week ago. He said, Grandma, do you know that your voice is streaming all over the place and people are using it for different things and they're playing it in the background while they do other things? And I said, oh, because I don't have a clue about TikTok. Even though she is not on TikTok, she is elated by the reception. She's so grateful to the young people who are listening to her and are sharing her sound. And she's really grateful that now people are starting to learn who she is. Some TikTokers are starting to say, hey, this is Tina Fabrique, and you know her voice. You should now know her face and who she is. I have to admit, I didn't know her name, and I've loved that song for so long. So I think this is great. What does she make of her newfound fame on social media? Well, I didn't even say it's more of a resurgence in fame. She told me that sometimes uh, people will uh, ask her, you know, wait, are you the voice of Reading Rainbow? And then they get really emotional. I even got a little choked up listening to the song at the beginning of this segment. She is just so excited. She's so grateful to the young people. And she also wants them to really take to heart the messages of Reading Rainbow. This is what she had to say about that. I do understand, you know, that maybe I had 600 followers or something. I now have 2,900 and something over the last three days. And my phone is constantly ding, ding, ding. Uh, someone followed you, someone likes this, someone likes that. I would say take to heart all the messages that are being given of this very positive show and this brilliant man, LeVar Burton. Even though she doesn't have her own social media or she doesn't really, she doesn't really follow her Instagram account too closely and she doesn't have TikTok. She's very aware that she's sort of getting this resurgence and she's so thrilled. And, and as she mentioned in that clip, she really wants people to remember the lessons they learned in reading Rainbow. And I just think it's so fabulous. Yeah, Callan, we have less than a minute here, but uh, do you think someone could make one with her face? I think that would be like the ultimate, right? To see her face with the music underneath. Oh my gosh, that would be incredible. I have not seen that yet, but maybe we'll see that in the near future. So when you see Tina's face and maybe it'll be text like, why am I not being recognized for my voice or something to that effect? Yeah, there you go. Exactly. And, and maybe that would up her social media following even more. All right, Callan, great story. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Does it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.